Better turn my mic on. Okay, uh, we will be broadcasting tomorrow night at 7 if you want to join us for Feast of Trumpets. Um, we'll be on Facebook, YouTube, and uh, CBS. So, there. Oh, yeah, Apple TV. Uh, NBC came crawling, but I told them no. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but, no, that's true. We will a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Romans 4, verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? I don't, sometimes it just works out this way. I, these chapters are picked at random. You know, we start Genesis at a certain time, then we decide to pick Romans or whatever. But, boy, these are kind of like, overlapping stuff here very much about what we just studied with Abram. And Paul's going to go into a big dissertation here about Abram or Abraham. And he's going to use actually two examples. Abraham and also David is the other one he's going to use. <clears throat> two of the most revered men of Scripture, by the way. And he's going to demonstrate the salvation or redemption only came from their faithfulness, which was a gift, by the way. Not from their works they performed from their own efforts. Verses 2 and 3. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before Elohim. For what does the scripture say? And Abraham believed Elohim, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Abraham believed and trusted in Elohim. This is how he was declared righteous. In Genesis 15, starting at verse 3, And Abram said, Since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of Yahweh came to him, saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who shall come forth from your own body shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you're able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your, des your descendants be. <clears throat> um, see, I think there's, there's going to be... Nope. Yeah, there's one more. Then he believed in Yahweh, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Now, that word believed, that's a tricky one here. Um, it, it's like I mentioned... Okay, believed here is... Uh, Amon is, what it, is the word, the Hebrew word... It means to render firm or, or be faithful, steadfast. Um, it doesn't mean what you think or how you feel. Okay, it doesn't mean that. <clears throat> I, I mentioned this the other day, too, uh, watching Jordan Peterson talk, and he was criticized for saying that he can't say that he believes in God. And I said, well, why not? He said, because it's in that word believe. The word believe has a connotation to it of obedience. So if I say I believe in God, that means I'm living an extraordinarily life, extraordinary life that is pleasing to God. And I'm not so sure I reach that level. He said, now, the, you didn't, the thing is, it isn't what do I say I believe? No, that's something different. What you say you believe and what you believe are two different things. What you say you believe are words. What you believe is how you live your life. It's either in obedience to him or not. Well, it says he believed in Yahweh. Now, what did that mean? That meant that he was obedient to the Father. He was obedient to the Father. And he reckoned it to him as righteousness. And he gave him a, a promise. You remember he said you're going to get the most beautiful red Ferrari, if you, if you just do what I say, right? No. He promised him something after he's dead. He promised him something after he's dead. He said, I'm going to live my life then pleasing to you because of that. <clears throat> Abraham, Abraham was reckoned as righteous before he was circumcised. Because he was faithful, he trusted the promise of Elohim. 
Not because he'd undergone circumcision. And that was your argument Paul's battling here. Is circumcision the gateway to righteousness or not? And he's saying it wasn't for Abraham. It wasn't even brought up. It wasn't even a subject. Verses 4 and 5. Now to the one who works, his wage is not reckoned as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. Okay, let me reword that using what believe really means in Hebrew. But to the one who does not work is faithful to him, but is faithful to him who justifies the ungodly, his faithfulness is reckoned as righteousness. Now doesn't that make a lot more sense? I certainly think it does. <clears throat> it's not our works. Circumcision in particular here is what he's talking about. The count toward our redemption. It's by our faithfulness in Elohim, which is just a gift from him. That was a gift he gave to Abraham. And through that, he justifies the ungodly. It's our faithfulness is what is reckoned as righteousness. Verses 6 through 8, just as David also speaks of the blessing upon the man to whom Elohim reckons righteousness apart from the works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin Yahweh will not take into account. Do you find it interesting that that's David that wrote that? He's, uh, Paul's quoting Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2, uh, which is a psalm of David, a masculine. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom Yahweh does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Isn't it ironic that he says that? I mean, this is the guy, uh, a man after Elohim's own heart, that was a murderer and an adulterer. <coughs> hmm. David. He was a murderer and an adulterer. David knew of the forgiveness and salvation man can only have through the graciousness of Elohim. How blessed is the man to whom Yahweh does not impute iniquity. Hmm. You know what? David considered himself blessed big time. That's what he did. Romans 4, <clears throat> verses 9 and 10. Is this blessing then upon the circumcised or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say faithfulness was reckoned to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it reckoned? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. Paul makes the excellent point that the righteousness of Abraham was reckoned long before he was circumcised. Uh, I got in my notes here, at least 14 years before he was circumcised. Now Paul's battling the mindset that those who are uncircumcised are unclean, they're unable to re achieve redemption or salvation, until they're circumcised. That's the mindset that Paul's battling here. That was the view of what they call the Judaizers in that day, those that were enemies of Paul, that were enemies of Messiah. They claimed Gentiles must first become Jewish proselytes before they could become a part of Israel. Paul is effectively refuting that erroneous teaching, and he's using the Torah and the Tanakh to do so. Romans 4, verse 11, he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faithfulness which he had while uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be reckoned to them. <clears throat> now, the covenant with Abraham, keep in mind, was never circumcision. It was the sign of the covenant. Genesis 17, verses 10 and 11 says this, This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin and it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and you. 
See, the covenant is you walk blameless. Abraham, you walk blameless. And I'll make your descendants like the stars of the sky, like the sand of the beaches, like the dust on the ground. <clears throat> Circumcision is the sign of righteousness. It designates that the person is a part of the promise made to Abraham, but not the covenant itself. You know, if we say that covenant is no longer in effect, then we deny the blessings to Abraham are in effect, which include a Messiah, by the way. That means we're all denying that all nations are blessed through Abraham. We're denying the seed of Abraham through which Messiah entered. Genesis 12, verse 3, And I'll bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. The covenant with Abraham is not circumcision. The covenant with, uh, with Abraham was that Elohim would make a great nation of him, <clears throat> and Elohim would give him the, that land of Canaan. In Genesis 17, starting at verse 1, Now when Abram was 99 years old, Yahweh appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Elohim Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. See, that's what he's told to do with this covenant. You have to be blameless. And I'll establish my covenant between me and you, and I'll multiply you exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and Elohim talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you. You shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be, called, shall be Abraham. For I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. And I'll make you exceedingly fruitful, and I'll make nations of you. Kings shall come forth from you. <clears throat> and I'll establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout your, their generations for an everlasting covenant to be Elohim to you and to your descendants after you. And I'll give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I'll be their Elohim. Elohim said further to Abraham, Now as for you, you shall keep my covenant you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin. And it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and you. With what was Abraham's part of the covenant, remember, walk blameless before him. It's in that very first verse. And we see that Abraham, guess what? He did just that. We find out for sure what walk before me and be blameless means. Genesis 26, starting at verse 4. He's speaking to Isaac here, by the way. Abraham had already passed. And he says, and I'll multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and will give your descendants all these lands. And by your descendants, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because... Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my Torah. The covenant of Abraham says all his descendants after him are to follow in this covenant. Everybody walk blameless. Genesis 17, 9, Elohim further said to Abraham, Now as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, throughout their generations. If you're Abraham's seed, you must follow the Torah. You must. If you don't, then guess what? You're not. You're not part of Abraham's seed, right? And he talks to us, Paul talks to us about who, who are Abraham's descendants. It's everyone who has faithfulness in Messiah, the one we just read. There's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. You're all one in Messiah, Yeshua. And if you belong to Messiah, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. See, there's a double reason why you should follow the Torah. Because one, you belong to Messiah. Two, because you're an offspring of Abraham. Right there. And it's... A, it's hmm? Yeah. Oh, they do omit that, don't they? Yeah. As a matter of fact, close to 10 out of 10 of them. 
that bring that passage up, forget about verse 29. Well, our part of that promise is to walk blamelessly before Elohim. No, he's just talking to Jason. It's not that difficult. You want to know an example, and he gave me one. I, I'm still kind of dumbfounded. Over the burden that the Pharisees or uh, the Orthodox put over the, the lay people. You want to give you an example? Before the Sabbath starts, you are to tear the toilet paper into sheets that you're going to be using. Okay? You are to tear them before the Sabbath starts. And I said the logical question. I know what happens sometimes. What if you don't tear enough toilet paper? Oh, there's a rule for that. What you have to do is go to the toilet paper and you cannot rip it at a perforation to where it's clean. That's a work. But if you tear it in an uneven fashion, that's not a work, and that's good. Now, you think they're not burdening the lay people. Guess again. Now, he just told me that, and I thought, oh my gosh. Uh, I'm sure I'm, we're going to get some, some, I'll get some doozies of examples, and I appreciate that one. But that, that's a, this is what Yeshua was saying. Man, you place a heavy burden on these people. You put a heavy load on their shoulder. But, you know, my, my burden's light. My yoke is light. My burden is, is very, very much nothing. So, anyway, I thought, wow. <clears throat> Our part of this promise, walk blamelessly before Elohim. So what, so what do we have to do exactly? Well... You, you can tear the toilet paper wherever you want. And even on the Sabbath day, you can tear the toilet paper. That's fine. Uh, don't eat poison. Okay? You're not allowed to worship false gods. You're not allowed to bring pagan worship and attribute it to him. Um, you, you have to take one day out of the week, the, the seventh day of the week, and rest. And get together on certain days to celebrate the timing of our father's cycles, okay? He has cyclical things for us that we are to remember that are certain times where he makes great things happen and has made great things happen. And that's about it. There's not much else. That's it. Love one another. That's a tough one. Shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. Uh, make sure we keep our covenants. Everybody keep their covenants, always. <clears throat> Did I miss anything? No? That's most of it, isn't it? That's 90% of it, yeah. What's that? I still don't get that. A symbol on the Sabbath. What? Oh, a symbol. I had a symbol on my head, and that's why I couldn't. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. A symbol on the Sabbath. That's another one. It's part of it. Get together with your friends. <clears throat> that's really easy to do here because the people are wonderful. Uh, I feel like all of y'all are family, and we got some great food. And there's beer in the refrigerator. So, hey. <laughs> um, I, I love meeting. I love being with you folks. I love studying Scripture with you. Go back to Romans 4, verses 12 and 13. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also follow in the steps of the faithfulness of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the Torah, but through the righteousness of faithfulness. Abraham was promised to be the father of many Nations, <clears throat> that all nations would be blessed through him before he was circumcised. He was declared righteous before he was circumcised. His salvation or his redemption came long before he was circumcised. But keep in mind when the covenant was made, he was to walk blamelessly before Yahweh. We are to do the same. 
Verse 14, for if those who are of the Torah are heirs, faith is made void and the promise is nullified. For the Torah brings about wrath, but where there is no Torah, neither is there violation. For this reason, it is by faithfulness that it might be in accordance with grace, in order that the promise may be certain to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the Torah, but also to those who are of the faithfulness of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now, here's the deal. What I call a Judaizer, it's really, that term is not really in Scripture. Uh, it's, it's those who were very, let's say, bigoted against those who were not Jews. And if they, these people desired to be a part of uh, our Heavenly Father's kingdom, they had to convert to Judaism. That's what Judaizers were in that day. They were getting the cart before the horse. They were wanting the sign of the covenant before righteousness. That's not the method of Elohim or of Scripture, nor is it the pattern followed by Abraham. Remember the preceding verse before Paul entered into this discussion of Abraham. Paul said that we establish Torah through our faithfulness, not vice versa. Romans 3, verse 31, do we then nullify the Torah through faithfulness? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the Torah through faithfulness. Romans 4, verses 17 and 18, as it is written, a father of many nations have I made you in the sight of him who he believed, excuse me, in whom he was faithful, even Elohim who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. In hope against hope, he was faithful in order that he might become a father of many nations. According to that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. There should not have been any hope for Abraham to believe the promise of Abraham, or the, the promise of Elohim, but he did. There should have been no reason, no hope, no reason for that at all. He's 99 years old. As far as having kids goes, he's dead. His wife's dead. <clears throat> you know, um, I'm trying to replace believed with was faithful, and it makes so much more sense. But as I'm doing this, what's going through my head is I think Christianity in their in their zeal to show that salvation is not by works at all, they're trying to make it all feelings. I think that's what they tried to do. Therefore, we have faith and believe instead of is faithful and faithfulness. I think that's what the mindset was. That, well, which is ignorant, but I think that's what the mindset was. Verse 19. And without becoming weak in faithfulness, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, in the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of Elohim, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faithfulness, giving glory to Elohim. And being fully assured that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Well, I'll be darned. 100 years old, still able to perform. Verse 22, therefore also it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was reckoned to him, but for our sake also to whom it will be reckoned as those who believe in him who raised Yeshua our master from the dead. Righteousness is reckoned not only to Abraham, but to all those who have the faithfulness of Abraham and are faithful to the promise of Elohim as Abraham was faithful to the promise of having a son. We know the son of Abraham and the son of David, Yeshua. He came to life. Just as life came from the barren womb of Sarah and out of that aged body of Abraham, life came from death with the re resurrection of Yeshua Messiah. See, this whole thing about Abraham and Sarah having a son at 100 years old and 90 years old is a testimony of resurrection, is what it is. We are to have that same faithfulness that Abraham had of life from death. Abraham was faithful to the Father 
in all his ways that the Father could produce life from death. In the same way, we are to be faithful to the Father in all our ways as we look forward to eternal life from death, just like Abraham. Verse 25, he who was delivered up because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. The resurrection of Messiah is proof that his promises are true. The covenant made with Abraham is still true. The sign of the covenant that Elohim made with Abraham long after he was declared righteous is still true. Righteousness is reckoned to us because of our faithfulness in the promises of Elohim. We are now to walk blamelessly before our Heavenly Father just like Abraham did. Because he was faithful that life would come from death also. Romans 5, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, having been justified by faithfulness, we have peace with Elohim through our Master Yeshua Messiah, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faithfulness into this grace in which we stand and we exalt in hope, the Greek word elpis, of the glory of Elohim. You know, hope, we, um, we, that word doesn't really fit this Greek word, elpis. Um, you know, we hope Arkansas will beat Alabama this year. We hope, okay? That's not what the kind of thing he's saying here. Uh, the, the word uh, elpis means expectation, okay? Confidence, expectation. <clears throat> In reading this passage, it sounds good and all that are justified by our faith or even faithfulness. But you see, that's not really the case here. In Romans 3, verses 3 and 4, Paul was speaking of the faithfulness of Elohim. Why should we think that Paul's not speaking of the faithfulness of Elohim here also? You know, when we look at this passage and the rest of the chapter, we're saved by grace through the faithfulness of the Father. And we've in Romans 3, verse 3 there, in verse 4, what then, if some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of Elohim, will it? May it never be. Rather, let Elohim be found true, though every man be found a liar, as it is written, that you might be justified in your words and might prevail when you're judged. So it's talking about the faithfulness of Elohim, and that probably is the case for the rest of this. We know for sure, well, for one thing, in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, that's what he's talking about. For by grace you've been saved through the faithfulness of the Father. That's what he means. Saved by grace through faith. But the way this is worded, Christians for generations and hundreds and hundreds of years thought that they were saved through their feelings. They're saved by their faith. That's not what that means. For by the graciousness of the Father, you've been saved through the faithfulness of the Father. That not of yourselves, the grace is the gift of Elohim. Not as a result of works that no one should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Messiah Yeshua for the good works, which are the Torah, which Elohim prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Romans 5, verses 1 and 2 there. Therefore, let's take a look at it like this. Therefore, having been justified by the faithfulness of Elohim, we have shalom with Elohim through our master, Yeshua Messiah, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by his faithfulness into this grace in which we stand and we exult in the expectation of the glory of Elohim. See, it's all the Father. It's all the Father. He's the faithful one. All we are are the <laughs> very lucky beneficiaries. Fortunate, let's say. Verse 3, not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. Perseverance, proven character, proven character hope or expectation. And expectation does not disappoint. 
Because the love of Elohim has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. We can rest assured that we can exalt in our tribulations because it's through his faithfulness that we have expectation that will not disappoint. We have this expectation because of his breath, his Holy Spirit within us. It's through our tribulations that the Holy Spirit shapes us into things that the Father can use, something he can use for his glory. You know, if we don't go through tribulation, if you don't, you know, uh, I love playing football. I hated two-a-day practices in the summer. Hated it, hated it, hated it. Why did they make you do that? Because they hated us? No. How do you get better? <clears throat> tribulation. It was tribulation. Very difficult. But without it, where are you? You're weak, you're unproven, you're untested. You're not capable. You're unworthy. So if you're going through some tough times, might be for very good reasons. Probably are for, is for very good reasons. We've got, to, we've got to build character. Perseverance builds character. Verses 6 through 8, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Messiah died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare to even die. But Elohim demonstrates his own love for us, toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Messiah died for us. Yeshua died for us when we were completely helpless and worthless. And Paul says, you know, for a righteous man, not many would die. For some good man, someone might dare to die. But Elohim demonstrated his love for us by sending his word made flesh to die for us when we were totally worthless Sinners. Verse 9, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of Elohim through him. We're justified through the blood of Messiah. It's through his blood we are delivered from the wrath of Elohim. It's through the faithfulness of the Father who promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he would save their people, that he sent Yeshua, Messiah, to justify his people through his blood. You know, we all are going to have to account for everything we do. <clears throat> His chosen ones, though, will avoid the wrath of total destruction, which is caused by sin. Verse 10, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to Elohim through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exalt in Elohim through our master Yeshua Messiah, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Paul's still making the case against the Jewish belief of salvation through the bloodline or through the affiliation of a certain group, because that's not, that's not the truth. We're only reconciled to Elohim through the sacrifice of Messiah. That's it. It's through the sacrifice of Messiah. We receive the breath of the Father within our hearts, and that gives us faithfulness to him. That's our only hope. Verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Now in this section of, of chapter 5, Paul's going to make a contrast between Adam and Messiah, between the, the lives of the two men. Paul says that sin entered the world through one man, Adam. Sin entered into the world because Adam ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which exposed his sinfulness. Uh, Genesis 3, starting at verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field, which Yahweh Elohim had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, as Elohim said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, Elohim has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, You, shall sure, you surely shall not die. 
For Elohim knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. You'll be like Elohim, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. <clears throat> um, scripture equates, well, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that's Torah itself, we talked about that. That showed Adam and consequently all after him to be sinful. Therefore, we all had to die. Scripture equates lack of knowledge with evil. Hosea 4, verse 6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you've rejected knowledge, I'll reject you from being my priest. Since you've forgotten the Torah of your Elohim, I also will forget your children. Wow. Paul also tells us he would not have known sin if not for the Torah. And that death came through the Torah. He talks about that in Romans 7, starting at verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the Torah sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the Torah. For I would not have known about coveting if the Torah had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the Torah, sin is dead. And I was once alive apart from the Torah, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. See, I think Paul understood that about the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I think he understood that, that it's the Torah. Romans 5, verse 13, For until the Torah, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there's no Torah. So Paul's stating here that before Adam partook of the Torah, his sin was not imputed upon him and his descendants, which is interesting. Paul's expressly stating that Torah has been effects since the beginning of time, isn't he? It's really what he's saying. Disobedience of any command of Elohim is breaking the Torah and often results in death. You know, as we have pointed out, virtually all the Torah, a lot of it can be found in Genesis. Men in that day were responsible for keeping the Torah of Elohim, just like we are today. But sin is not imputed where there's no Torah. You know, there are those, though, then, who've never heard the Torah, are they safe? Well, the answer is no. They have a conscience, and that conscience is enough of the Torah that they will fail that too. They'll stand condemned. And we went over that a couple weeks ago, Romans 2, verses 14 through 16. For when Gentiles who do not have the Torah do instinctively the things of the Torah, these not having the Torah are a Torah to themselves in that they show the work of the Torah written on their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alter alternately accusing or else defending them on the day when, according to my gospel, Elohim will judge the secrets of men through Messiah Yeshua. <clears throat> Verse four, whoops, back up there. Verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Death reigns in the world, even among those who are too small to be responsible for their actions. Death came into the world to all of mankind through Adam. Death is a consequence of all life through the sin of Adam. Because now all the descendants of Adam are responsible to Torah. Um, what about man's sin, sinful nature? What about man's sinful nature? Does Orthodox Judaism talk about that? No, because it's not in Scripture. Right. We don't have a sinful nature. We just, we just are who we are. <clears throat> Verses 15 and 16, But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one the many died, much more did the grace of Elohim and the gift, of, of the, uh, gift by the grace of the one man, Yeshua Messiah, abound to the many. 
And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression, resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions, resulting in justification. So it's contrast here between Adam and Yeshua. Through one transgression, death and more transgression followed. From many transgressions arose the free gift of the grace of Elohim, resulting in justification. Through Adam came the gift of the curses of the Torah that they were not able to follow on their own efforts. Through the blood of Yeshua comes the gift of the Spirit of the Father, which gives his chosen ones a heart and a desire to be obedient. Verse 17, for by the transgression of one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Yeshua Messiah. Death reigned over mankind through Adam, but the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through Yeshua Messiah. Verses 18 and 19. So then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. For as through the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one the many will be made righteous. Through one man's disobedience, all men were made sinners because Torah became alive and condemned their sin. On the other hand, on one act of obedience, justification came to all men. Through Adam's disobedience, many were made sinners and condemned through the obedience of Messiah, many were made righteous and have life. Verse 20, and the Torah came in, the, in that the transgression might increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. When Elohim's Torah was given to man, transgression increased. Sin increased because if for no other reason, man's awareness of his sin definitely increased. Adam immediately realized this. What did they try and do? They tried to cover up their own nakedness. But with the increase of sin grace abounded even more. But don't forget the words of Paul two verses later. In, in chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may, might increase? May it never be. How shall he who died to sin still live in it? Yeah, the argument came from some that, well, if the increase in sin increases the, gra the graciousness of the Father, why not sin more? Well, he May it never be. <clears throat> How shall we who died to sin still live in it? And lastly, uh, chapter 5, verse 21, that is, as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Yeshua Messiah, our Master. So the, the contrast here between Adam and Yeshua is blatant. We're either in Adam in our sin, which leads to death, or we're in Yeshua in righteousness, which produces life. Um, and I think to read this properly, to finish up, read this properly, verse 21, that as sin reigned in death, even so grace, through the faithfulness of Elohim, might reign through righteousness, which is his spirit within us, to eternal life through Yeshua Messiah, our Master. Any uh, any thoughts? Any questions? Yeah, Bruce. The only difference is the purpose. It was Adam was not to eat of it, and Moses at Mount Sinai, everyone was to had to follow it. And that was the command. Really, the same thing. There was no difference. The only, the only difference is the intent. Us. Yep. Sure was. So that sin is imputed to everybody. <clears throat> as everybody is imperfect. Anybody else?
Okay, let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this, this time we've had together. Uh, we pray, Father, for uh, you, you to give us your righteousness, to open our hearts and minds to your truth. Give us the, the will, desire, and uh, to walk in your ways and to love your word. And may Yahweh bless us and keep us. And may Yahweh make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. And may Yahweh lift up his countenance upon us and give us shalom. Amen.